Hey there, Brett with Solarola. I'm here to tell you, now is the time to go off-grid. Now is the time to put up a solar panel array. I've been putting up uh, off-grid setups for about 20 years. That's right, baby! Woo! Yeah, keep low. You know, I started way back when we were using lead batteries, and you know, solar panels were about a dollar per watt, so quite a bit. But now, the panel prices have come down. Now, with lithium batteries and the development of lith lithium batteries, the whole equation is getting pretty sweet. But even more so, the key and the reason why I'm saying now is the time to go off grid is because of the used solar panel market. So I've never really seen a solar panel fail that wasn't physically crushed, which means used panels, they're going to be just as good as new. So obviously used panels, pretty cheap. So there is a plethora at this point of used panels around. Look on any marketplace and you'll find them. And you can get those panels down to about 20 cents a watt. My panels I actually got for, I think, around 16 cents a watt. And they've been powering my farm here for almost three years. So we're making this video because we're adding um, a couple rows of panels to my existing array. And we thought, hey, we haven't made a video of the construction of our array. Again, I used used solar panels, which kept the cost down. And I milled my own lumber. So the second part of the cost here is the mounting. So if you can find a reasonable steel mount, that's great. I milled my own logs, so I got basically log firewood that I got, and I picked out the good logs, and I milled them five by five. They're oak, so pretty stout, pretty strong. And then I used metal brackets. So probably the metal bracketing cost me about 250 bucks, probably including the, the bolts. So also, uh, we are in northern Wisconsin, so we have to deal with frost and upheaval. So upheaval is basically when it frosts down in the ground, it'll push up on different like concrete mounts and such, and your, your array will get all kittywampus. So here you can see I'm all measured out, and I'm starting to put in my first footing. Those footings go down five feet. They have to for frost, and they're about 10 inches wide. So we use the sono tubes down a hole. And the way that these holes are made are an auger on the back of a tractor. So thanks to my neighbor, Ray, who we eventually put up 64 panels that he is firing directly into the grid. So here's a guy that spent much of his fall and even some of his summer making firewood, going out into the woods, cutting the trees down, cutting it up, bringing it out with a skid steer. Now he can kick back because he's going to make enough power during the winter to cover his electrical heating needs. And he's going to store enough credits during the summer to well pay for anything that he might go over in the winter. So pretty amazing. Anyway, thanks to Ray for punching out the holes for me. And next, we um, just started putting those sono tubes. Those are the big tubes that go down the holes and hold the concrete. We had some metal pieces, some kind of rebar and metal pieces that hold the beams. So those go down into the sono tubes and are kind of balanced there. And then you pour your concrete in. So you pour your concrete in, in bags. I do it kind of simple. I pour a little concrete, I put a little water. I pour a little concrete, I put a little water. Because eventually it all sees water and it all eventually all hardens up. There is all the footings. Um, and then from there, we built up. So my 87-year-old dad, he was with me during a lot of this build. So you'll see him popping up in some of the pictures. He has since passed. You got me in the picture too, Carol? Um, no. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Don't worry about that, Kara. Yes, I could care less. But I want to see what kind of a log it is, you know? I guess. But his memory lives on in putting a wrench in my hand at an early age. And it's really from there that uh, my love of cars came and eventually the reason that Solarola came about. So thanks, Dad. He was a pretty funny guy. It was a little bit difficult to work around him because he's he, he pretty much knows everything. So so I had to always pass everything by him. But we do miss him here. Anyway, 
We milled five by five oak logs. And then we began from those footings, erecting posts and then putting beams together. And then eventually we made rafters out of putting two one inch five one by five oak boards together, screwing them together with a little bit of industrial glue between them to create a nice rafter system. And then it's just a matter of putting the panels up. So one by one, inch by inch, and then wiring that in, putting the conduit down underground, getting that into the shop over to where the batteries are. So what do we have? Seven kilowatts per module. And I think we've got 15 modules hooked up right now. So right around 100 kilowatt hours of storage. On any given day, we'll see about 10 kilowatts from our solar array. And then six, eight hours of that is about 80 kilowatt hours of energy. So having a 100 kilowatt hour pack is pretty cool. However, having an electric car charging at the same time, much of that energy goes in there. So that uh, takes a little bit of the brunt of the pack away because now the pack is somewhat in the car too. So we use two Schneider's inverters. I'd like to do three or even four. We also have a couple of Outback Radians. So we've got some different options. There you can see our Schneider inverters and we have Schneider charge controllers. And what's really nice about the Schneider system is the readout. So on my phone, I just click the app and I'm looking at my power coming in from the sun. I'm looking at what I'm using on the farm. I'm looking at the history. And here you can see all the history of the three years that we've been solar charging. So a lot of times I switch off the grid if I go out of town. I switch off the solar, I should say, and I switch on the grid. If I have a cloudy day or I really need to charge the car up, I am interacting with the grid a little bit. So as much as this is a representation of the solar power that I've harvested over these three years, there's a lot of times when we were on vacation and such, but you can still get a good idea of sun in Wisconsin and why we are actually pretty bent on getting up a wind power. We are adding two more rows of panels. So I'm involved in that now. I got some of the boards up now and that's gonna give us easy another probably four and a half kilowatts of energy. So that times six, another 20, 30 kilowatt hours per day to add to our system. I'm gonna add two more rows of panels to my solar array, get a little bit more power. More importantly, get a little more power like at the top. Okay, cause we're kind of in a little bit of a bowl here. So that's winter sun gets pretty low and there's some trees that it starts to hit. So we want to get another couple rows way up on top here. So it's a bit daunting. It's way up there. I'm going to have 20 foot posts that are going to support them. But as my grandmother used to say, inch by inch, anything's a cinch. So I've got seven boards up already. And as you can see up there, and I got one more to be halfway done today. So that's my goal is to get to the halfway point today and then collapse. So I would like to say that uh, the amount of electricity we've saved has paid for the panels. Not everybody's going to have the opportunity, the desire or the financial situation to do batteries. Of course, we are um, off grid here, so we have a battery system. Now we are still switching over to the grid a little bit, especially during the winter. However, remember, most of the year, we are charging an electric car plus running a pretty good sized farm. Here at Solarola, we are going for complete electrical off-grid. So we have our electric tractor, we have our electric quad and our snowmobile and our mower. And of course, everything here will become electrified. And therefore, we have the freedom to power everything right here. To do that, we got to make up a little bit of space in some of the winter months and some of the cloudy periods. So we are going to be putting up a wind power. Now, I've done a couple wind power uh, towers and turbines, and the conclusion that I've come to is you need to have a big turbine, like really wide blades, when there's not much wind, so that whatever breezes are coming through are creating power. However, when the wind comes up strong, or God forbid, a storm, you don't want those rotor blades to be long because they are catching a lot of wind and they can become damaged. Also the same thing with the tower. You want that tower up really high, as high as you can get it. However, when the storms hit, that tower being up there takes a lot of brunt. I actually had one tower go down on me. So what we want to do and what we're going to do here on the Solarola farm is we're gonna make a telescoping tower. So basically we're gonna use one of these old windmill towers 
that I got from a neighbor that used to pump water here in Wisconsin for a farm. We're going to start with one of those. And then inside that tower, we're going to put what was a cell phone tower. So a pretty stout little tower, but smaller, that's going to go inside. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able with a series of winches, we're going to be able to raise and lower the tower. So that's going to give us the ability to get way up there into the wind. But then when the storms hit or the wind's blowing too hard and it makes the system vulnerable, we're going to want to drop that down. Also, we're going to make the blades retractable. So we're going to do blades that probably start out around four or five feet each for about a 10 foot in diameter turbine. And then we're going to use actuators inside some telescoping tubes on the blades to extend our blades. So we're going to go from a 10 foot diameter to a 20 foot diameter or more. And of course, when the winds hit, we're going to retract them. So we're going to have to have a slip ring system on the rotor because of course we're going to need to get power out to the rotor and be able to, from the ground, extend and retract those blades. So that's how we're going to get maximum power. And that's how we're going to get maximum reliability and safety out of the system is be able to get up there and open up, but also shrink and drop down for obvious reasons. What we're going to do and what we're in the process with right now, as far as extending our solar array, we're going to make a deck on the very top of our array that goes over to the wind power. So the wind power tower can provide a little bit of support for the array and vice versa. So there's going to be a small deck there, and that deck will give me the ability to work on the turbine. So that's another thing that's really important with wind power. It is a mechanical device. There are moving parts. Be prepared to do a little bit of maintenance. And so create a situation where it's easy to get up there and deal with the rotor and the generator and anything that might go wrong in that area. Plus, with this um, tower coming down, as I'm mentioning, it'll be so much easier to do repairs or improvements on the turbine. So like I said, we're going to go up with the solar and then over to the wind power. So there's going to be a little bit of a deck up there at about 20 feet. And that's where we're going to put a row of parabolic troughs. So one thing that's been in the back of my mind as we are off grid now here out in northern Wisconsin is we need these parabolic troughs because we could have a 40 below zero day. But if there's some sun, I can generate mass quantities of heat. So a solar panel makes about 20%, if you're lucky, of the power of the UV radiation it receives, whereas a parabolic trough can get 90, 95% reflection of those infrared rays which are coming off the sun. So quite a bit more power than a solar panel. However, that is just straight heat. And then, of course, if you wanted to take, turn that into electricity, there's some conversion losses, but we're not worried about that because what we really want to do is we want to pick up that heat. So we'll have 50 foot of parabolic troughs going across the top of our array. So that's the spot where we're going to get sun in the winter because we're in a little bit of a bowl here. So the parabolic troughs are going to need to be up high. So it'll be 20 feet off the ground. And of course, everything is going to need to be really structurally sound to handle wind up at that height. However, we are in kind of a bowl, so we're a little bit protected, which is why in the first place we got to go up so high. So this video is kind of the first step of us sharing our process with you of going completely off-grid in northern Wisconsin. So going off-grid in San Diego or LA or California, even Oregon where we used to live, a lot easier. You don't have the cold, you don't have the snow, you don't have the weeks upon weeks of thick clouded snow cloud weather. So it puts a big challenge on us, but it also requires us to understand our equipment better and the vehicles that we build are more equipped to handle different uh, varieties of climate. So it really puts us to the test. So it, I really think that it, it helps us develop. The idea here is that everything on the farm, sometimes I refer to it as the freedom farm because that's the underlying intention is to just have our own energy and have everything operating on that energy. So converting everything to electric, using the high quality lithium iron phosphate batteries that are now available with 10 year warranties and battery heaters right inside them. It's, it's really all here. So it's really exciting to put this package together and we're going to share every step of the way. And probably the last step, once we get everything operating electrically is we'll go to heat pumps. 
So heat pumps are a way to use kind of the ambient environment as a way to help your energy efficiency when it comes to heating, hot water, things of that nature. So that'll cut a lot of our heating and hot water needs. It'll cut that electricity, could be up as much as cutting it in half. So that's pretty exciting. And then a lot of that energy can go more for charging vehicles and uh, running hot tubs and, and all kinds of good stuff. So that'll kind of be the end of it. We'll use our ponds as thermo devices because at the bottom of those ponds, even when it's 40 below outside, the water is still about 50 degrees. So that's a way for us to utilize some ambient warmth of the earth to make our systems more efficient. So stick with us on this journey because it's going to be exciting. I'm super motivated to do it. I'm super passionate about it. Kira is as well. Of course, Kira is bringing also another dimension of that by canning videos, you know, and all of these, all of these different ways to preserve food and to grow food um, so that we can have everything right here that we need. She's also got the goats going and we do milk the goats and we do make cheese and of course our chickens are putting out quite a bit of eggs every day. So all of that is part of the Freedom Farm. Come along with us on this journey as we make our way towards pure, raw, off-grid freedom here in northern Wisconsin.